today, authentic passion, the expulsive power of a new affection. The series I've been bringing to you has been about spiritual renewal, and we've been looking at Romans chapter 12. And by the time we're done with this series, we would have, uh, well, this part of the series anyway, we'd gone through the whole chapter. But I wonder if you'd open up uh, at Romans chapter 12 and just a little bit of recapping here and now. Uh, 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 the, the passage begins with the command to present your bodies as living sacrifices to God on account of all that he's done for us. And this is our reasonable service to present ourselves physically, physically before the Lord, physical obedience. And guess what? We're still here. <laughs> We're still doing it. We're still alive. We're still physical on this planet. Yes, we are. And you are here. We are here. We've presented ourselves again to the Lord today. Then verse 2 and 3 talk about being transformed. Transformed. The transformation of life that takes place from the inside out. It begins by renewing your mind. And having a renewed mind, the new mind, the new mind of Christ in us. And that's about the miracle of God that he's worked in our lives to give us a new heart, a new heart, a new mind, a new spirit, a new hope, a new name. And in that newness, he is constantly renewing us as we walk with him. And so then the Apostle Paul from verse is, uh, 3 and onwards, sorry, from, um, from, yes, from verse 3 and onwards in Romans 12, he goes on to talk about how we should serve one another. The grace of God upon us is also the grace of God in us that operates through us to bless other people. God blesses you so that you can be a blessing. Now, there's a good reason to be blessed. Why do you want to be blessed? I want to be blessed because I like being blessed. Why do you want to be blessed? I want to be blessed because I want to be a blessing. That's a very good motivation. And here, the blessing that he's talking about that we pass on is serving one another, uh, exercising a spiritual gift. And this can sound a little bit mysterious and mystical if we're not careful, but it's rather like this. You know, today, in these last six weeks or so, all over the world and here in Britain, we've seen people serve their community. People who maybe have been furloughed from work say, okay, I'm not going to sit at home doing nothing. I'm going to serve my community. So there have been people delivering food on bikes and motorbikes and people uh, taking dogs for walks and buying food and vegetables and for neighbors and people who are vulnerable and many, many, many other ways where people have been serving others. At the frontline services, the, the National Health Service, we still stand outside our doors at, at 8 o'clock on Thursday and applaud the National Health Service and what they're doing. And many of them have put their lives at risk. And also in the uh, other, other uh, ho hostels and homes, care homes, and, and people who are taking care of sick relatives and friends. and st sick. It's been a wonderful thing to see, this, this community spirit, and people sharing and giving what they have. And this, that's a gift. Now, when we do it, because of our humanity, it's humanitarian. When we do it because of Jesus, it becomes spiritual. I, 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 not, nothing wrong with being humanitarian, but when we do it to the Lord and serve others because we're serving the Lord, that adds a supernatural dimension to the gift, and it becomes a spiritual gift. Sometimes the spiritual gifts are things like prophecies and things like that, passing on information from the Holy Spirit that we would never have understood before. Uh, many, many other ways in which we serve one another. Now, then the Apostle Paul moves away from the idea of spiritual gifts into Christian lifestyle. It's about Christian character. Now, if we are thinking about the renewal that God is bringing us into, and what we see around us could well be it, because we have had the hard discipline week after week now for six, seven weeks or more of seeking God, shutting ourselves in with him, dealing with big issues, stuff that maybe we wouldn't have had time to deal with uh, before. Also, we have been facing, certainly in, in our church, a wave of difficulty and opposition and, and demonic attack 
there's been no doubt in my mind that the enemy has tried to tear us apart. And, 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 and we've just said enough's enough. We stand together. We love God because we are better than this. We are better than to allow the enemy to get advantage over us. We are better than that because Christ lives in us. And because Christ lives in us, we have a new life. And that's really my theme, how we can walk in the newness of life that God has given us. And here the Apostle Paul drills right down to it. And he begins in these passages that we're looking at from verse 9 and onwards. It, he begins with love. Let love be genuine. Now, I, I did this last week. We, we looked at this last week. And if you recall, uh, authentic love is learning to love the things that you used to hate and hate the things you used to love. Because love is not just about a feeling or a personal choice. I love tea. I love coffee. No, I prefer mineral water. That's not what love is about. Love hooks up with the truth. Love is on the side of truth. And, and uh, if, if, if we truly love our neighbor as we love ourselves, we'll do so because we love God, who is the truth, and we seek after God, who is the ultimate good. This is what Christian life and living is all about, pursuing the good, having within us a new desire, a new passion, which is born out of the love of God at work in our hearts. And because of that, we uphold truth. Now, many people say, all you have to do is, is basically love your neighbor as yourself, and, and, and that's okay, right? I understand that's a good principle, but that principle of love has to be enlightened by truth. So suppose if I was to do something good for you, what if it wasn't really good? What if I thought it was good? I remember uh, hearing a story, a tragic story of a nurse many, many, many years ago who thought she was giving the right dose of medicine to a child in ICU. And what happened? It was the wrong dose. And that child was blinded by those eye drops. That nurse was devastated. She thought she was doing the right thing, but in fact was doing something harmful. So we can, we can use our common sense for a lot of things. But, you know, if we're really to know what is good and best for us, we have to look to God's word, to God's revelation. He made us. He created us. He knows how we best function. We also realize that our own minds are often confused. There's a lot of arguments. I think about the time of the book of Judges, which was a mess. It was a mess in the book of Judges. Everybody did what was right in their own eyes. They turned away to other gods and idolatry entered in. Enemies came and it was a mess. And economic devastation happened and they could hardly survive. They turned back to God and then they were healed and restored. But then the process went back again. Doing what is right in your own eyes. The Bible says there is a way that seems right, but the ends are the ways that lead to death. No, we need to be enlightened. We need to know that by what we consider doing good to somebody actually is doing them good, which means that we'll look to God who is good, who is the good, the ultimate good, and love is on the side of righteousness and purity and truth. That's a little bit about love. I said more about it so that we can... Um, keep this fresh in our minds. It's a very important thing we need to realize in today's world where love is ill-defined. But now we talk about something else, walking in authentic passion. This is the new life that God has given us. Do you know God has made you a passionate person? No, 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 no. Far more passionate than that. Far more passionate than you think. Do you know that deep down in the deepest part of you lies a passion, a passion that one day is going to take you over completely? And one of the big jobs you and I have as brothers and sisters in Christ is to stir up the passion that's inside, to provoke one another to love and to good deeds. That passion is what I want to talk about today. And it's found in the next verses, Romans chapter 12, verses 11 through 13. It says, 
Do not be slothful in zeal. Lazy, lazy. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. So that's why I've entitled this message Authentic Passion. And I have a subtitle, Learning the Expulsive Power of a New Passion. The Expulsive Power of a New Passion. What's that all about? God has given you a new passion that is so strong, it will overcome every other passion in your life to take first place in your life. And that is how you learn to turn aside from the things you used to love, the things you used to desire, even if they still mess with your head and you still think that they are so wonderful and so attractive and got to be right. God shows you no and your new passion takes over and you put God first and his righteousness and recognizing that he is the only one who is worthy to be praised and worshipped. Authentic passion. Now that statement, the expulsive power of a new affection, comes from a Puritan writer, a Scottish Puritan minister by the name of Thomas Chalmers. And he lived in, one, in, in 1780, uh, up until 1847, 1780 up until 1847. That was the time of William Wilberforce, and the great social reforms and the poor acts and all the things that was happening, happening and uh, the you know deliverance from slavery throughout that same period. Also, he lived uh, during the time when Handel's Messiah was born. So that w w was, was written by Handel. Now, that is the kind of era in which he lived. I want to tell you about him. Why do I have to go back so far? I don't. There are great examples of men and women of God today. But, but in that generation, there was something special. It was just the aftermath of the great evangelical awakening in times of Jonathan Edwards and, and other great evangelical moves of God in this country. And, and Thomas Chalmers uh, uh, was, was a kind of a minister, but he wasn't really a believer uh, and I understand he said something like this, you know, a minister ought to, well, he was Scots, so I don't know if I can put on a Scottish accent. Anyway, he said uh, a minister ought to be able to do all his work in two days and then spend the rest of the week enjoying himself on more pleasurable pursuits. Hmm. Ah. Don't let any ministers take a leaf out of Thomas's book until he found Christ. When he found Christ, he became a passionate, dedicated servant of the Lord. And, and he, he was so passionate about Christ that he thought, I've got to I've got to find a way of bringing God to every home in Britain. He was described as a man of extraordinary energy and passion. And he was an unrelenting advocate for the poor. And he lived his whole life as if to answer this one question that he constantly asked himself is what is the most effectual method of making Christianity so to bear upon a population as that it shall reach every door and be brought into contact with all families. In other words, he says, how can I get the gospel to every person in Britain? And uh, so preaching and teaching, of course, but also such compassion on people who were in need, especially, especially the poor. And uh, he he did a whole lot of reform reforms, trying to make the church make sure the Church of Scotland had small enough parishes with genuine ministers who cared for the poor, and the parishes small enough so that the needs of the people in that parish could be met. You know, it's a bit similar to to what we're seeing today: is the church rising up again with social action, food banks, and caring and feeding one another, just as as it was in the early church. And so these were great days for the gospel in Great Britain and in the nation of Scotland. And it was that man who wrote a book called The Expulsive Power of a New Affection. Let me tell you a little bit about the, the idea behind this. You see, back in that day, everybody thought, well, if you were just a moral person, a good person, didn't go to 
you know, do anything particularly bad. You kind of paid your taxes. You kind of gave some money to charity. You know, you didn't rob any banks and basically kill anybody. And you were a basically good moral citizen. Then you were okay. You'd done your bit. And you're going to go to heaven. And, and that was all there was to it. But, you know, Chalmers was actually concerned about how superficial this was as a message. And there's passages like this that would have drawn his attention. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, and here it is, listen to this, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Now, if you believe that the Bible is the word of God, then you will recognize that the world spoken of here is not just this beautiful habitable world. It is this world system sold under sin and the desires of this world will draw you from God. So actually the Bible says if you want to be a friend with the world, you'll be an enemy with God and friendship with the world is enmity with God. And so this is what I meant. When you become a Christian, you have to learn to hate what you used to love. You used to love the world, but now you hate the world because, you see, the world takes you away from Christ. It is a lying world. It's saying, my pleasures, the things I give you are lasting. They are true and they are fulfilling. No, they're not. There may be some pleasures in sin for a season. There may be intense pleasure in sin for a season, but only lasts for a while. It doesn't give you the fullness of joy. It doesn't give you life. It leads to death. It might seem right. You, you might, might look right, taste right, sound right, just as Eve saw the fruit and she said it was good. She saw it was beautiful to the eyes, pleasing to the eyes, good for food. It tasted good. It looked good, it looked as if it would taste good. And it was desirable to, to fulfill my life, to make me wise so that I know how I could live my life my own way. This was going to give me freedom and liberty. And yet it brought death, bondage, decay. And ultimately, as I said last week, it led to the very coronavirus that we're isolating from. Sin entered the world and death through sin. No, 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 no. There's a lie out there. It's a deception. And yet Chalmers recognized, as we do, that there's something about the desires of the flesh, something about the desires of the eyes, the things that look so good, feel so good. And wow, look at this is so good. Wow, this is so fulfilling. And if it looks good, it feels good, it must be good, right? Wrong. Well, only God is good. So now we have a problem. The problem is if we are overtaken by the desires of the flesh and every single one of us, friends, me included, just let me alone to the desires of my flesh and you will see a flesh pot in front of you. Oh, yes. Without the Holy Spirit, we have nothing. We can do nothing. We can't lift a single finger to please God. Without the Holy Spirit, without the new nature, without this new affection, this new passion that God gives us, we would be a slave to those old passions. But God has come in the person of Christ, entered our world, died on the cross, demonstrated once for all what love is all about. And in his passion, which led to his suffering and death on the cross, poured out the love of God for you and me so that I could be changed and you too can be changed. And as a result of that, friends, we can learn to refocus our passions and expel those old desires with the new, all-powerful passion of Jesus himself. If you think about it, uh, many of our passions, our emotions, many of them, they're kind of neutral, if we think of the word anger, um, it can be 
something very positive. It, not if it is about losing your temper or being angry with somebody. Like Jesus, when he went into the temple, he was angry. What was he angry? He was angry against sin. That's what he was angry about. He said, you've made my father's house a den of thieves, and it's supposed to be a house of prayer. And, and that energy that was released, he drove them out of the temple. He hadn't, didn't lose his temper, but it was a righteous kind of anger. Now, we have to be very careful before we say our anger is righteous. But, but think about this. It's very close to having a zeal. How, are you not angry at sin? Are you not angry at injustice? And we need to have that right kind of anger, as long as it's a godly anger, that attacks the problem, not the person. Then how about love? Love is a kind of emotion, isn't it? Uh, and we can love the wrong thing, but we could still kind of call it love. You know, it, it's that sense of, of an emotion or a fixation on something. Um, and hate, lust, we see desire uh, can be good or bad. It depends what you are desiring. If it's a good desire, it's a godly desire. If it is a wrong desire, it's lust. And so our emotions can be just used in one way or another. Joy, we can feel good and happy at some good things. We can also rejoice, you know, over, over evil. <laughs> if, if, if there are plenty of examples of people who are very happy. Uh, sometimes when things go wrong with our lives, there are people who are jumping up and down for joy when they see your suffering when they see you're in, you in trouble. But no, 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 that, that joy is not correct. Uh, what we have to do is be joyful about the right things. So it's not so much the emotions themselves, it's where they are directed and what motivates them, what drives them. And so the way that we move forward is, is not by trying to uh, switch on or off certain emotion switches or correct responses in ourselves. No, it's to focus, to refocus our passion on the one who deserves it. It's to pursue Christ with all our heart, to be passionate about the right thing, to desire the right thing. And when we do this, we discover some of the things that the Apostle Paul talks about in this passage. Verse 11, Romans chapter 12, back there again. Romans chapter 12, verse 11. And he says this, Do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer, contribute to the needs of the saints, and seek to show hospitality. Let's look at these things very quickly. This is a burning white-hot passion that's on the inside of you. And that is the new you. That's the true you. And we walk in the newness of who we are because God has removed the old heart and put a new heart in, taken the old passion out, put a new passion in. And while we still struggle, we go deeper and deeper and deeper into our heart and we discover the truest thing, the most basic, truest truth about us is that we are passionate for God. That's your job. When you have fellowship with one another, stir one another up, stir, excite one another's passions for the Lord. And it comes out, first of all, in service. Do not be slothful in zeal. Ah, I love it. This unrelenting advocate for the poor, a man of extraordinary energy and passion. That was Thomas Chamber Chalmers. And we too, we too have that same passion if Christ lives in us. Don't be slothful in zeal. Come on, he says, stir yourself up. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. This is the big difference. Fervency, serving the Lord, zealous for God, stirring up your passion. Ignite your passion. Stir up your passion. What we're going to be doing before Christmas, starting this month, is training new cell leaders and we're going to be using the book, A People of Passion. Mm -hmm. That is the training book. That's the training manual. And I wrote that book. And it, a whole idea came to me talking about Mel Gibson's movie, The Passion. Now, the word passion in that context means suffering. So you could have the passion of, of, of St. Peter, the passion of St. Paul, or any other person who was martyred, suffered, and was martyred. 
passion. That's what it means, suffering, passion. But because of the other side of the meaning of the word, to be passionate is about how we, we are deeply and greatly moved. And you know, the two are connected. Because Jesus suffered and died for us, because he gave his life for us, that is what will ignite your passion. On Tuesday evening, when I was speaking to the men in the men's net, somebody asked me a question online, said, you know, how, how do you stir up your passion? There's lots of answers to that, but you know, the best place is come back to the foot of the cross. You don't know what love is until you've seen Jesus dying on the cross. This is what love is. Not that we love God, but that God sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And when we take a look at Jesus on the cross to see what he did for us, he didn't have to do this, do it anything. He gave his life for us. He the, he, the just, took the punishment of the unjust to bring us to God. In other words, he carried our sin. He did it because he loved us. He did it to rescue us. He did it to rescue us from the consequences of our sins. And when we repent, turn and come back to God, we are set free and we can have a relationship with God, the very relationship we were designed to have in the first place. When that film, Mel Gibson's film, The Passion, first came out, my it created a stir. They said, how could you possibly have so much blood in a movie? I remember a friend of mine who, was, who used to cut my hair back in the day. I told him about the passion. He said, it's a horrible movie. It's too full of blood. But only the previous week, he'd been telling me about one of the Kill Bill movies. I forget it was Kill Bill 1 or Kill Bill 2. I don't know. But I do know this, those movies were so full of blood and he loved them. I said, why would you like a Kill Bill movie full of blood and be put off the passion? And he said, oh, Catholic guilt, he said. I said, what do you mean? I said, is it possible? Is it possible that seeing Jesus suffer for you, it, it, it actually touches your conscience and you feel that therefore, a response is due from you to give your life to Christ as Christ gave his life for you. And the man went away very, very thoughtful. When that film was first shown, one of the first places it was shown was in uh, Australia, New Zealand and Australia. That's the where the clock comes up first in the day. And a friend of mine, took a group of people to watch it in the cinema and uh, the very powerful effect that movie had upon many, many people. My friend was a mission uh, a minister, missionary, crazy person, an Australian living in Sydney, uh, sorry, an American living in, in Sydney, absolutely passionate for God. Uh, anyway, he's watching this movie, sees the movie, and the movie ends, and he's so caught up he stands up in the middle of the movie theater, regular movie theater. It wasn't hide out by Christians, regular movie theater. And he said, Jesus, I will follow you anywhere. Why? His passion was ignited when he saw what Jesus did for him. When you see the love of God for you, the length to which God has gone, sending his son, bringing his son into this world to live with all this muck and smell and and to be rejected and hated and beaten and crucified. All of that. That you and I might be brought back to God. We needed a, an atonement. We needed a washing. We needed a cleansing. And only the blood makes atonement for the soul. Jesus died in your place and in my place. And because of that, we can't say we are our own anymore. Every moment of every day belongs to him, friend. It is time to rise up and serve Jesus with the passion that, des that he deserves. Amen and amen. Let's put aside wishy-washy, mamby, pamby, war, Luke, warm Christianity. Let us rise up with a white-hot zeal for Christ as if we have just received a fresh uh, uh, understanding and experience of the resurrection power of God and the reality of what it means to be alive today in Christ. Oh, amen, amen.
Don't be slothful in zeal. Be full of joy, he says. Rejoice in hope. Rejoice in hope. When you see hope, you have something to, re to rejoice about. The people who suffer from deep depression because they've lost sight of any hope at all. And that's why they have the opposite of joy, depression. But when you see hope, whatever experience you're in, whatever you're going through, it doesn't necessarily mean you'll walk around with nice sugary emotions everywhere and frothy emotions just like fairy floss. No, no, no. But you will have a hope and you will have a deep joy and a joy that will live with you, a joy that will take you day by day. And as you know, it's the joy of the Lord that is your strength and we rejoice in him as he rejoices in us with singing and dancing. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Be patient in tribulation. If you know... There is a purpose behind everything. And that passion, pur that purpose is the passion of your life. You can endure anything. Yes, you can. The things that we go through because of those we love. What we put ourselves through, what we allow ourselves to go through because of those we love. What we do to ourselves because we want to achieve a passion in our life. Whether it's sport or music or anything else. You know, they say no pain, no gain. We will endure anything if there is passion in it and we have a desire to do what it takes to get there. Wow. So he says, patience, endurance. Then he says, prayer, be constant in prayer. Never lose your passion for prayer. We need to pray now more than ever before. We haven't even got going yet in terms of prayer. God wants us to multiply prayer and to remultiply prayer, to redouble our efforts, to pray every day, to seek his face during this time. Only that way can we push back the powers of darkness, including this coronavirus. Only then we'll be able to push back the powers of darkness that seek to come to destroy, to rip us apart, to tear us apart, and to take away our testimony. We must stand firm in prayer. So let's pray with zeal. Don't forget the Bible says the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous person has great power in its effects. It's fervency, praying with fervency, rising up with prayer, not with slothful, not being slothful or, or reluctant or reticent, but being really passionate about what we're doing when we're seeking God in prayer. Then it goes on to say, yep, the needs of others contribute to the needs of the saints. Show hospitality. And this is this again is almost addictive. When you give and take care of other people, the blessing that comes back, it's not that you're doing it so that they will love you. If that's why you're giving, forget it. They won't love you because you do this for them. No, and then if you stop doing it, they'll stop loving you. No, it's not about bribing uh, people to love you, trying to buy friends or trying to feel good about yourself. No, but if you focus on their needs and give to their needs uh, and, and you see the blessing that comes to them, you are blessed. As Jesus said, it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. And this kind of passionate giving, passionate praying, passionate enduring. I'm going back through the list. Passionate uh, rejoicing, passionate serving. All this kind of passion is enough passion to change our spiritual environment, to change the spiritual destiny of our family, to see growth come into the Christian churches, to see our society so saturated with salt and light that it can be changed. People of God, it is time to rise up with real passion and move forward in that passion to serve the Lord. Amen and amen and amen. But don't forget, deep inside of you, the deepest, most certain part of you, there is passion. It's the new life that God has put into your heart. And if you have not yet received this new life, I'm going to lead you in a prayer right now whereby you can receive this new life. And for those of you who need a bit more of that passionate zeal to come back. We'll be praying for you as well. Okay, let me explain what I'm going to do. And after this, you can talk about it straight away in the Zoom room, in the welcome room. Now, here it is. Salvation is a gift. 
It's, it's not what you do. It's what God has done. And let this Bible represent the gift of salvation offered to you by Jesus on the cross. All you have to do is receive it. And when you receive it, it's a gift. You don't say, how much do I owe you? No, no, no. What do I do to earn this? What do I do to deserve this? Or what, you know, why, why you know, am I worthy of it? No, no, no. What you do is simply receive it and say, I humbly receive it. That's the hard part. That's the hard part. So many people are, will ref, refuse to humble themselves and say, Jesus, I cannot save myself. I need you. But if you know you need him, that you have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and you need Jesus in your life, you will be ready to receive him now. And here's how. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. You can echo this prayer either out loud or in your heart, but it's a prayer in which you can ask Jesus to be the Lord and Savior of your life. Are you ready? Here it is, everybody. If you need Jesus now to pray this prayer, here we go. Lord Jesus Christ, Say it now. Lord Jesus Christ, I recognize who you are. That you are the Lord who died for me on the cross and was raised again from the dead. Thank you that salvation is a gift from you. I now receive it by faith in your name. I declare that you are the Christ, you are the Son of God, and I declare that you died for my sin, and on the third day, you were raised again. Come into my life, be my Savior to save me, be my Lord to govern me, and be my friend at my side every day of my life. And finally, as we are together forever, in heaven. Amen and amen.